It's quarter to 12, Nigeria. We either get it right or we fall off the brink. Welcome to a quarter to 12. Every month, we speak with remarkable Nigerians about their lives, work, and the lived Nigeria experience. This month, I'm speaking with Fuad Lawal, head of growth at Eden Life. Fuad is a young Nigerian that leads a dynamic life with a career span that ranges from media and communications to tech, food, and travel. Thank you very much for joining me today, Fuad. He's been described by different people to me. Some call him a content creator. Others say he is a problem solver. Others say he is a great strategist. So let me see if I can ask him to tell us what he is. What are you, Fuad? What do you do? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay, so it's, it's always a little awkward when people ask me what I do. Um, currently, okay, so currently at my full-time job right um i'm i'm concerned about one thing growing revenue right all the marketing efforts and all the sales efforts that make sure that money continues to come to the company and salaries are paid it's called like it's a growth through call it growth that company is called it growth um but I, that's that's the thing about you isn't it because you kind of worked in the intersection between media yes tech yes and even uh sort of consumer yes services yes that's where i am now so for now i i think that fundamentally every single discipline right the way the way the way like matter is um is built on atoms right i think every single discipline is built on a co- like a bunch of skill sets that you accrue over time right um and i mean when you break down what what it takes to be a doctor it's a couple of skill sets of course that you try to practice and master over like what's a decade or two right um and and i like to think of myself with a person with a bunch of skill sets and it's like oh what kinds of spaces can i apply these skill sets um i know the learning curve I, I'm looking at the learning curve. Is it three to six months? Do I have that type of space? And my my mindset about doing things is, if I have some skills that are sufficient enough to like get started, while I get started, I just like double up and pick up the skills that should help me excel at them. Um, I mean, uh, you're very much respected and seen as Mr. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Um, among a, a group of people who themselves are not without talent, and many of whom are very accomplished themselves. In fact, um, someone said to me, Fuad is a god. <laughs> <laughs> so how does one become a god at the tender age of 29? I think, first of all, that person is ridiculous. <laughs> because, like... Th- they have poor taste. <laughs> <laughs> no, on a serious note. Yeah. Okay. You know you've had impact. So maybe let's talk about the impact you've had and why you think within certain circles your mind is respected, your work ethics are respected, and your world view. work ethics are respected. Yes, and your world view is respected and you're seen <laughs> as a leader. Okay. Um, I, I think that, um, I think first of all, I've been lucky with, um, employers um, I've, I've worked at active full-time jobs for less than a decade actually uh, my first full-time job was in 2015 right and um, which is what makes this a little <laughs> much more remarkable yeah so um, I remember my first job interview when they asked me if like what experience I had like that I could it was it was at Pulse Nigeria, like it was publishing, right? It was not just publishing, it was tabloid publishing. It was like how many stories can you ship in a day? Right? And I said, Well, um I I did the, I told them that I did this flash fiction challenge where I had to write a short story every day by myself. So I I, I was always worrying about this was 2013, 14. I was always worried about oh writer's block, no writer's block. And I was like, you know what, I'm just gonna write every day. Anything that happened that comes out to come out. 
right? So that was it was just that exercise. I wanted to do it for three hundred days. I didn't even succeed. I did it for like a little over hundred days, but it got me a job nonetheless. Um, and while I was working there, that was where I got my crash course in, in, in what it means to to understand the media engine. I had not, I had no clue what it was about, right? I was before then, I was just about the sciences, right? And I was there for nine months. By January 2016, today Red Media um, hired me to work on an experiment called Party Jollof, and it was like just try to write interesting things. That was, the, I still think that's one of the most important jobs I had. Why? Because um, it was basically, it was like getting thrown in a lab, given a salary, and told, you know what, try anything possible. They were just daily targets that were wicked, <laughs> brutal daily targets, but they were the most, that was my, that was my boot camp in creativity. Like, there was a job that required me to push and continue to push and push and push. Um, while I was there, um, my old boss dragged me back when I was working at Pulse. He dragged me back to Pulse. Um, said that we're going to do interesting things. And I was like, ah, yeah, hey, interesting things. And then I got there and I was like, oh, wait, oh, wait, oh, wait, oh, wait. I think these people are going to realize that I'm a scam. And, <laughs> <laughs> and then I suggested to my boss one day that um, I'd like to... So it sounds to me like you suffer from imposter syndrome yes it is very very intense and I, I will get to that it is extremely intense and i was like um i'd like i told him i'd like to do a road trip around nigeria right um and it'd be so nice if i had a job when i come back <laughs> but it was like so my pitch to him was how about i do it and i'm traveling as an employee of this company of pulse right um, and presumably documenting and yes, creating content. Exactly. Okay, how'd that go? Um, it was my crash course in Nigeria, right? So, I mean, I've, I've been to a couple of cities across Nigeria. So first, let's start with your mode of travel. Yeah. Did you fly? Did you nope. drive? What did you do? It was like, how would the average Nigerian travel and interact with Nigeria today? It was strictly public, public transport. Right. Um, in fact, the only time it was not public transport was when we were transported by a military convoy from <laughs> Bernu to Yobe. Right. Not under our own. Like, we did not ask for it. <laughs> we were in polite detention. <laughs> but I'll, I'll get so it was purely tra- public transport. You go from one park to the other, from the park in Osho, that was where we started. Um, we. Who is the we? You had a team with yes, you? Yes. I, I was traveling with Chris. Chris was my colleague from the office. And the third person was Jesse Loba. I ran into him at an exhibition a few months before I traveled. And I said, oh, I'm traveling around Nigeria. He's like, ah, can I come? <laughs> yeah, so he didn't leave Lagos with us. He met us in Benin. I remember we were coming out of the palace and I just met him waiting outside. And he's like, let's do this. <laughs> so what did, what did you learn about Nigeria? And, uh, and, oh. I, and I presumably you did touch every corner of yes. Nigeria. Yes, I, I, wa- I was in every state. Um, it was... It was it was enough to get a sense of the pulse of the people, but not enough to understand the zeitgeist. But when, like, zooming out, like, at everything, like, um, I think one thing that was very, very strong and compelling is the fact that there is no sense of a true Nigerian identity, right? I, um, so there's this thing that happens to people where when... Um, their safety, their sanctity is questioned. They they tend to default to tribe, right? Um, and Nigeria has not given people an incentive to identify as Nigerian inside Nigeria. So I Ev- mean, when when you talk to people about that, there's a way in which, um, do, even though the intention might have been different, yeah. but um, our identity has in many ways become how we access state resources yes um no matter how poor they are yes whether it is entry into a university whether it is entry into a unity school whether it is appointment into government offices because everything is done around federal character and a bunch of things so identity has become one of the ways in which the meager state resources that do exist are distributed do you think this has a bearing on why we tend to sort of put identity, um, ethnic identity over and above national identity? I, I think people put ethnic identity because of survival, 
right? Um, so I was I was at Zinam Dikano's house, for example. This was like two months before this the military stormed this house, and I saw people crying. Like he came out of the house, and people were crying. It was the most fascinating sight. A woman came from Asaba in crutches to see Zinam Dikano. Um, and the conversation they were having that I remember was that Anambra state elections were happening in a few months and they were talking about how it must not happen, right? Everybody like sitting protest. People were bringing, people were bringing their like ram for him to bless, right? The name I kind of saw was a Moses, like an actual Moses, right? Um, and they were, they I were, him as well yeah, that time, so I kind of remember, yeah, so. so and you go everywhere and you find that people are extremely tribal like in in, in the when i got to taraba when i went to gimbu they had the, like some conflict that just finished um, like you settler the yes the yes right um so like every single like something that was consistent in every place is that every single region region in nigeria has an ethnic um some ethnic tension brewing right and the interesting thing is that because we do not um like we do not have the infrastructure for like high quality hyper local media what happens is that by the time it bubbles to national circulation it's already late mm. like it's uh, like the damage has already been done right and when people's lives and when people's like sa- safety is like under co- like if they cannot if if the country cannot guarantee then their tribe can so people always choose but, their tribe so if you if you examine that yeah. trip 2017 yeah and we're now in 2021 almost four years on and look at sort of for example the biafra story yeah it has sort of escalated and some of the other conflicts you know that you probably came across and the way they've escalated um where in your view does the solution lie does it lie in um, enabling people to go their way in the way that the secessionists want um or where does it lie Personally, I think that it sounds it sounds basic, right? But I really think that um, I'm one of the people that one of the opinions I I hold very strongly is that if we do not have a conversation first of all, like about the Nigerian civil war, and like apologize, like like every wrong party on every side apologizes to everybody that they have wronged, right? Nigeria cannot progress because um, there's a deep distrust. That we have for each other, right? And the the fundamental ingredients for economic development is trust. There is some element of trust, right? And if you cannot get that, Nigeria cannot progress, right? Mm-hmm. And I also think that by doing that, um, uh, we also create a template for how to solve other ethnic problems. There's still the mother care effect that has been happening before, probably before I was born, right? Um, I I th- I think that I I don't I don't think like. Um, secession or, or breaking Nigeria is necessarily going to like have the most like impact. Like I don't think it's going to push any of those regions forward drastically. Mm-hmm. That's what I think because you end up with the same problem yes, within those regions. Yes, because when well, I was when I was in the east, Kingsley Mogalu, yes, as you know, who contested for yeah. the presidency in 2019, came out um, to basically um, suggest that we need some sort of truth and reconciliation yes. commission yes. of the type that you had yes. in South Africa could this be a way forward in your view yes it is like it is a w- it is the way forward um like the way we have um Cervicom and in in every state we should have that in every like every local government in this country right yes of them, right? yes i know there's the there are the infrastructure cost and there the like the cost of running that but it also it could also be a thing maybe it's tied to maybe customary courts in different places or anything but if we do not know how to because when nigerians and, and it reflects even in as basic as like traffic right when nigerians encounter other nigerians or they have disagreements with everybody defaults to force every single person defaults and to force. ironically i mean for those of us who've traveled abroad yeah once you cross that border you don't identify mostly as your tribe. Yeah. You are Nigerian. Exactly. That's and what we tend to be yeah. quite proud of yes. <laughs> that identity. Yes. To the extent that um, other Africans kind of just hate us for what they call yes. our confidence <laughs> and our brashness. Yes. Now you took a similar trip again in 2019. <laughs> yeah, yes. This time traveling around 
West Africa. West Africa. Yeah. What did you learn? That was history? interesting. West Africa was interesting. First of all, um, the shock value that Nigeria had for me, West Africa did not really have it because I would literally see someone in like say Sierra Leone and it, they look like someone I've run into in say Asaba, right? Because West Africa is actually a country <laughs> in the true <laughs> sense. Um, and it's funny because every country has like a different way that they perceive Nigerians, right? Um, in Senegal, it's, it's j- a little disdain, right? Because they're like, oh, like, they're doing fraud, those people, those people, right? They're always just... Chas- the Senegalese are a bit jealous. Yes. Because if Nigeria wasn't there, they'll be the biggest... Yeah. In, in West Africa, <laughs> so they're a little... Gambia, I remember being at the border in Gambia, and this officer kept saying, like, who do you think you are? Is it because you think you're a Nigerian? Like, oh, God, calm down. Nobody's fighting so with they're you. They're already projecting yes, onto you exactly. a certain behavior. Sierra Leone is very interesting. When you tell a Sierra Leonean you're Nigerian, this, like there's this instinct to say thank you, oh, wow. right? Because of their war, yes, yes. Ekumog. Um, Okadas are called Okadas in Sierra Leone. Um, I, I I ran into a minister in Sierra Leone, and she had only good things to say. Most people, like even at the border, they're like, oh yeah, now we can't cheat you. You are our big brothers. Like there's always that big brother vibe with it was it was actually quite warm. Um, I love Liberia a lot. Um, but again, Nigeria, whenever you're from... Is there like a, 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 a central message that you sort of put together or came to a central, I don't know, thought yeah. regarding our role yes. within the sub-region Thank as you for a result asking. of this travel? Thank you for asking. Nigeria, <laughs> West Africa's problem is Nigeria, is that we are the irresponsible big brother. Hmm. Um, Interesting. I feel like we are we are the, we are the biggest force in the in the region, right? When we got to Cote d'Ivoire, the bo- Elubo, the border between Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire, there was these wide roads, um, really wide, and they were, they were empty. And I was asking, like, why is it empty? And they're like, oh, your president shot the border, right? S- three borders away, right? One police in in Abuja affected three borders away. Um, I I think that I think that. A lot of what Nigeria was great, uh, like or what we think Nigeria is to be great for, what we expect Nigeria to be great for, right? Um, some other small countries in the region are beginning to like step up and like just even okay, let's just take for example, um, you know, Ghana is investing heavily in cultural capital, right, in the region. Mm-hmm. Um, even though we know that if you are going to use cultural capital as a thing, the bulk of um, the year of the return, for example, now, right, they ex was well executed very solid strong cultural impact but even if you had to look at history you uh, you find that um like a bought a huge like percentage of the slaves that were taken we're taking from nigeria mm. right um in sierra leone they're investing heavily in tourism right did you did you did this thing that you talked about did you was it palpable the sense of disappointment in nigeria yes and and what that tells me is they feel Nigeria has a responsibility to them. Yes. Did they feel they had a responsibility to Nigeria? So, for example, when you talk about closed borders yes. and the impact it has had on the economies of the smaller yeah. countries, was there at any point a conversation around the smuggling, the bringing in of arms, and all the things which the border closure kind of tried to address? So, if you look at our little brother, yeah. Bini Republic, yeah. which on paper, I think was it last year or the you know the year before last, were the largest importers of rice <laughs> <laughs> in the world, and you knew exactly <laughs> where that rice was headed for. Yes, where they basically bring stuff, repackage it, um, to the detriment of you yeah. know, our policies and all yeah. that. Did, did, did they? Did you get the sense that they understood the role they also played? I, I think that people are fundamentally um, opportunistic, mm. right? Um, People in Benin Republic saw an opportunity and they're taking it. Right? If you it's kind of like um it's kind of like what's um there's this book, Prosperity Paradox. And one of the fundamental theories of the book is that if you are trying to solve a problem, right, and you're trying to use force to solve a problem, you put a premium on that problem. So corruption, for example, right? Um, um you make corruption harder. Right, what you do is put a premium on corruption. You're not solving corruption, right? But when you create better alternatives, suddenly nobody's interested in corruption, 
right? Mm-hmm. I think I think that like border closures, for example, for me they're lazy. Mm-hmm. Right? It's what our parents would do. And it's I, I think the cultural code for authority in Nigeria is is just force. Mm-hmm. Use of force. Um the, the, a, a child doesn't do something right, you beat the child. A soldier cannot move fast, he flogs somebody. Um, how we, how we much can't of that do you think is um, down to our uh, military history? And how I, th- I think a huge part of it is that. Um, but it's also interesting because um, um, I, I, Nigeria is very special in the sense that you're traveling across West Africa, you're seeing people like West Africa, they do not have our temperament. Everybody's chill, nobody's in a hurry. Um, but again, that's also a Lagos thing, that's a city thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but even in Accra, Accra, everybody's chilling in Accra. I, I think. wouldn't be in New York. Yes. <laughs> right? Yeah. Know, so, yeah. I, 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 about yeah. Big cities yes. And that drive yes. And all of that. I, I think that the huge part of it is like our military play, plays a huge part in it, and when it's, it's one of the reasons why, um, like when you think about the fact that when when people think of, I remember a story from when I was in secondary school that someone said, Idiagba was no longer in power, right? He got to a bus stop. And they saw him. People were fighting that time. Boss, he came down from the, from his car, and he just stood. And people just fell in line. They didn't fall in line because they respected. They fell in line because they feared him. Mm. That, and like people, were, when I was a child, that was cute, right? I went to a military school too. So, so we we've not been able to develop what um, in other places is called an honor system. Yeah, where people do the right thing no. simply because it is the right thing no. to do. Um, and, and can we grow and develop? if we continue doing things out of fear i mean w- what are in your view given what you've seen traveling yeah. across nigeria traveling across west africa and sort of in the last two years us grappling with covid yeah and all of its attendant consequences most of which are health sorry much of most of which are economic related what are the prospects for nigeria in your view and what is the role of young people such as yourself okay. in this country um or what should we do Okay, so there's something I believe firmly in, um, and I'll, I'll go back to secondary school science. There's this concept called osmosis. There's this phenomenon called ho- osmosis, where a thin moves for a region from a region of lower concentration to a region of higher concentration. Right? Um, the examples they used for us then were potatoes and salt water. Um, but in the context of our society, right? Um, let me use people, human resources. There's there is a natural law that's kicked in where people like high quality people by high quality people I mean highly skilled people right with ser- with good spending power like reasonable spending power are looking for how to migrate from this region where there's a lower concentration of people like them to a region of higher concentration like Canada like the UK and those people are making it ridiculously easy right um, I don't think anything can stop that Right, because we already know that Nigeria's biggest export is her people, right? And that I mean, I, I don't know if it already happened last year, but um, remittance was supposed to um, super, like was supposed to overtake oil with mm-hmm. amount of. Um, I, I think the the pandemic kind of slowed yeah. that down because people. Did, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Because I remember, I think 2019, 2019 or twenty eighteen. I can't remember one of those two years. There was it. There was it less than thirty million, thirty billion dollar gap mm. between oil and remittance. Um, anyway, I think that we need to figure out systems that will rapidly upskill people to pick up high quality skills that have global demand. There is n- there is no idea that I believe in be- believe in more strongly than that. I'll give an example. Um, um, I mean, I ran into a kid in 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 Joss in 2017 he was on strike um his school was on strike Bauchi polytechnic and we were talking about we, ju- we just struck up a conversation and he was telling me about how um he's studying computer science and how like he wants to learn how to like code and everything that was interesting that was fascinating um and i asked him that like, if you could learn how to make anything if you could build anything right now what are you going to build he said that since they're riding kekes he finds that um most of the accidents are caused because someone is not paying attention and he wants to if he could he would build something into the kekes that will just make sure that people like the kekes stop before they hit anything now it was fascinating to me because that tech is already mainstream Mm -hmm. 
right? For it's, cars. Yeah, it's, it's it's mainstream for cars, mm. right? To a large extent, like we know it, and you you start to wonder what would happen if he had access to like high quality resources and opportunities, right? And and I also don't think and because he is because he is. In, um, essentially a polytechnic I have to assume is in his late teens yes um, in Europe and other places children start learning coding exactly sometimes from as early exactly as five. exactly so I, I, I think that there, there are a couple of interest I feel like um, the government cannot create all the jobs that we need we've run out of time but we need systems that we can create and build where people are rapidly exposed to like a larger supply of like those opportunities um for example i ran into there's this series i used to write when i was at zikoko called naira life and i spoke to this woman she said she thought for a long time that she was cursed to continue earning 150k any job she goes 150k 150 nobody wants to pay more than 150k and then she just ran into someone like pure serendipity and the person was like um that the person was like, "Oh, like you should, you should try to say you can speak Igbo well. You should go to Fiverr, and or uh, and something, and help people translate documents." And what happened? What that led to for her, her was that she now became a thing. It now became a thing where last year during the pandemic, when people were at home, like people were paying her, like Nigerians in diaspora were paying her just to, like, teach them Igbo over Skype. She made a killing during the pandemic she was doing like 1.6 million every month during the pandemic when all of us were taking 50 50 percent pay cuts right it's a job that it's an opportunity or revenue money that will never be accessible to her here but they, there is demand outside and we need to figure out how to rapidly make those opportunities available for people so i mean that's an interesting example that you gave of the woman sort of you know um, upgrading her earning ability yeah by selling skills to an international audience with a buying power yeah um realistically though can we build a functional country that is based on us earning from people abroad i i many economists that you speak to tell you no um we are almost 200 million yeah and what we need to do is become productive yeah but also promote our people's ability to 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 earn and then to buy themselves yeah um th- that's a very good question thank you for asking um i i think that it's it's i don't i don't think it's going to be a one size fits all thing um, I think that what what tends to happen with those things is that the the natural like market forces tend to kick in, right? When people have more spending power, right, they can spend more, and whenever they spend more, like it just creates more opportunities. Um, whenever people gather skills from new places, those things trickle to other people, right? Um, there's someone I know. Um, he like he has been working in tech for a long time, right, and it was a lot of him figuring it out himself, and what he decided to start was like a fellowship and the entire point of the fellowship was if you're a teenager you have prospect prospects like um you're a teenager with like um very serious promise you might not have access to opportunities because i mean life. things are happening right mm-hmm. life um and it's like oh yeah that fellowship is supposed to look for all those people right and make sure that even if their environment is not working for them like li- like we have to make life work for them um, and I think that um, I think that when all those little little things happen, right, they compound, right. And the only thing that can make um, that can make that we can use to attempt to ac- accelerate it, right, is making sure the market, like they are in, there's the market is as free as possible for people to come and try things and learn things and and try to make things. So this is this is an idea of kidnappers. Of pastoralist problems, yes. you know, of um, bandits, you yeah. know, that are sort of running rogue everywhere, of cultists, of gang wars, of separatists, of um, all sorts of things going yeah. on. And um, as someone who has no lived a bit longer than you, <laughs> 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 I can actually comfortably say that I've never felt that Nigeria is on the brink as much as i felt it is on the brink today so literally each of the issues we're facing on its own would be enough 
to wreck a country and yep. we're dealing with sort of multiple of those issues, uh, multiples of those issues. So how hopeful are you about Nigeria? Um, it's funny because when I, whenever I think about hope in Nigeria, I think about the next election cycle. Um, same like a lot of other people. Yeah. This thing of thinking there's one person yeah. who will <laughs> become a leader and kind of save us. Yeah. People okay. believe that's the wrong approach. Some people believe that's the wrong approach. So I believe strongly. Ab- there's something I also believe again. I believe that like all entities tend to run on the same like underlying principles, right? An entity is an individual, a company, a state, right? Um, if we believe strong, strongly in like thoughtful leadership at the company level for example why do we think that like a thought like thoughtful leadership at the state level cannot change things right there's always this thing where people where there's this thing where like nigerians try to blackmail other Niger- and gaslight other nigerians into saying but you are you becoming better nigerian human beings will be opportunistic right america has always been racist until trump came and the racism became like but can't we have both uh, both well, why can't uh, we talk about thoughtful Nigerians while also looking for thoughtful leadership? Or must it be one or the other? No, it, it doesn't have to be one or, the, uh, one or the other. But, like, one person is responsible for, like, many things. For example, right, um, people say stuff like, people say stuff and they're like, oh, if you want to do the, to look at me, I tag the road of my village. That's n- There's nothing to celebrate about being the person that tag the road of your village. You f- pay tax. Do you understand? If you did pay tax. Uh, if you did pay tax, right? I, I pay pay, right? <laughs> I pay tax. <laughs> and I think the moment I realized I pay tax, I just came angrier. <laughs> and like, um, I, I, I think that I believe very strongly in um, in thoughtful leadership that drives people to, to take action, right? And we've had moments in Nigeria where um, people felt very hopeful about their leader. We've had those moments. Um, I remember... I remember um, my mom was a civil servant, and I remember when Yara was president. And I like I remember people saying like there was a lot of enthusiasm. This was, this was before he fell sick and everything. He, he, he was. He had a lot of goodwill. Yeah. Yes, and he he, like he, he was one person, yeah. right? And but that person made the difference because I feel like I feel like um, in the bid to say that. Um, oh yeah, but Nigerians should do better. Yeah. Like we undermine the, the like the impact of like quality leadership. So, are you saying we shouldn't be asking Nigerians to do better? I I, I know that you don't do black and white. And yeah. At least what I've heard is that you're actually a great believer in nuance. Yeah. And so, if you bring that mindset to yeah. this conversation that we're having about building a better Nigeria. Yeah. Um, what would be the recipe? Um, I, I, I think I think it's it's going to be first of all thoughtful leadership, right? Thoughtful leadership that understands the importance of open markets and access, right? You can't have little and policy little. Like you can like you can't make things hard. Like it's as it's as basic as in, in marketing for example, right? There's a the concept of the funnel, right? Every stage of the funnel you lose people along the stages of the funnel, right? The tighter it is. Exactly, the tighter it gets. You can't have like little. Like if, if 100 people get in your funnel, you know that maybe like 2% will get to the end of the funnel. You can't have 10 and be policing the 10, mm. right? I think that Nigeria is a stifling funnel. Okay, and, and I'm sh- suspecting that this conversation is being driven by what's been happening in the tech space, which is also a place that you sort of played. Yeah. Okay, so. I don't even think it's just tech. Mm. When you think about the places where government regulates the list, right? You think of people like entrepreneurs, some of them are in tech. You think of entertainment, right? And it's like coincidental that some of the places where Nigerians, young Nigerians are excelling the most, where there's the least regulation. That's the strongest signal that they, sh- they should just step back. Do you understand? Let them, you know, Allow people flourish. So how do we get to elect these thoughtful leaders? Have you sort of thought about that conundrum given some of the limitations of our current party arrangements? Yeah. Um, frankly, I don't know. Right? Um, 
it, it, it goes it still goes back to osmosis is like how do you upset that balance of like and when i say high quality people i don't even mean people that are like high flying like everyone just has access to like quality ideas and environment that allows those quality ideas to even flourish right um I, I was listening to a podcast about i also believe in this thing again that of course nations are like all nations are like moving along a conveyor belt some people are more far uh, further ahead than others others i was listening to a podcast about the u.s elections in the 1800s <laughs> weird example but they it was a thing that in the 1800s like a person would literally walk up to and uh, with to someone and uh, to a party member at the polling booth and say like look this is my vote. This is the, can I have a sandwich for this vote? vote? Th- that was a thing in the US, right? And there are examples of other societies where, um, like, that we now look up to where they were also just what Nigeria is today. And when you think of the things that made a difference for them, it was, and it always starts with, sometimes they are lucky. <laughs> mm. Like, maybe person snatches power or something. But like, it always starts with thoughtful leadership. And I don't know how we're going to do it in Nigeria. I really do not know. If, if if you know anyone that has those answers or ideas, I'd like to consume as much of it. But I I like one of the things that people tend to do a lot is disrespect the amount of work that these like the two biggest parties in Nigeria have put in. Like the amount of infrastructure they have mm. um, at the grassroots level. And people come on the internet and just believe that you can upset all of that. Let's yeah. talk about the internet. Yeah. <laughs> and the impact it has had <laughs> on your life personally and obviously on some of these economic sectors that we're talking about yeah. and the sort of enabling environment that has been created and, and maybe even touch a bit on the Twitter band. Um, um, what does the internet mean to you? Um, the, the internet is like an integral part of life. Like in the internet is like people think people think of the internet as a place, right? Like just one place. The internet is an integral part of life as we know. It's like like that. It is now interwoven with life. I think that first of all, um, I don't have I don't, I don't have the stats to back it up, but um, digital the digital economy is most certainly one of the largest creators of opportunities over the last decade for young Nigerians. Um, and it has been I've I've ne- every single job I've had, I found it off Twitter, for example. Every single job, right? My first job, my everything. Somehow a relationship from Twitter somehow led to those jobs. And I've been working for what? Um since twenty fifteen, right? Um I think that the the best thing you can do for people is to make it as accessible as possible to people because that is the only way. That is one of the easiest and quickest ways to upset that balance. There's an image I'll never get out of my head from Burning Kudu in Jigawa, right? It was Friday, Juma. It was this large crowd. And as people were leaving Juma, they were going towards one guy, right? And why were they going towards this one guy? Because he had a POS. And he was the only financial institution in Burning Kudu. Mm-hmm. So everybody withdrew their money? Yes. Through him? Yes. Right. They paid him exactly, and, and he gave them cash. Yes. For a little interest. Yes. And you think of, when you think of him as a terminal for for access to something they'll never have had access to. And I think of how much of a multiplier effect the internet will have, right? In just making it accessible to people. When you think of the fact that for many of the people that I know that work in say tech, for example, what 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 tends to happen is that they're in school. Nothing in school is making sense to them. They find the internet. They learn so much of the internet. And they make a living off what they've learned on, on, on the internet. And you start to wonder what will happen, um, what kind of effects that will, ha- that will have. Um, in theory, of course, because we are in, in reality, these things are expensive. These things are difficult. I mean, there is fiber. So from, from, a, from, a, from a policy point of yeah. view, should we be looking you know, to, to build a Nigeria where access to the internet is almost like a given and yes. it's a human right and yes. the government needs to subsidize I believe it. very very strongly in it so if you were asked today if we, should we take the money from oil subsidy and put it towards fiber optic internet access 
giving people I've, who I've, have yeah. uh, the, the, the opportunity access to data, etc., etc. Is that a trade-off that you think? Yes. Um, yes, and I'll tell you why. Um, I, I believe that the single most important thing here for the individual tends to be spending power around spending power, right? Beyond the fact that, like, we know that I, I believe in. I also like believe in the concept of like welfare states. Like, the government should take care of some things, right? But like, spending power is an important thing, and I feel like in an in an economy where like people have enough opportunity to have more spending power. Subsidy is not going to be like your biggest problem. Like mm. the, the cheapest place we bought fuel across West Africa was Nigeria. Right. That's the cheapest place that you get fuel in, in West Africa, and that's why I, I heard that there was the. I think I've read somewhere before where people come, they dock in Lagos, and then they go and sell in other places because it just makes sense. Dock in Lagos, collect subsidy in Lagos, go and sell in other West African countries. That's it. That used to be a thing, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so, like. If we if 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 we take subsidy and use it for those things, like I don't think historically when I, when when Nigerians like young Nigerians think about subsidies, they, they, they think back to 2012. I think the real problem people had with the 2012 subsidy was just the manner of approach, mm-hmm. right? Um, but yeah, I um, I I I, th- I think that g- democratizing access to high quality information and opportunities would drastically change. The fortune of Nigerians. Mm. Now, let's talk about stories. Yeah. Because I know you're big on stories, which is yeah. why you sort of keep traveling and trying to sort ah. of <laughs> gather as many as possible. I mean, as someone who sort of works in the the media space, um, what insight can you give us around the way the Nigerian media space works and that balance between um, making money? you know, for sustainability, yeah. which matters, and providing content that is impactful and that can contribute in real tangible ways to nation building, whether yeah. that, that nation building is in holding power accountable, or whether it is in basic things like, um, you know, giving, um, giving publicity and promoting the creative sector yeah. so that people's works are sort of you know, highlighted and yeah. celebrated, that sort of thing. Hmm. I, I think I think that um, um, so I, I randomly used to tell people this thing that everybody feels basic like until you hear their story, right? And like to put that theory into practice, I used to when I was working in Lekki, I used to roam around Lekki and just randomly just chat people up. And hear all kinds of interesting things, mm-hmm. right? That was when I learned, for example, it's the that line, every line, every everybody's got a story. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's how I found out, for example, that most of the Okada people in Lekki are mostly traumatized. So on the internet, you see people abuse Okada men and say they're dumb, right? Mm-hmm. But they're mostly traumatized because most of them are from many of them are from Chibok, Askira, North Mubi, East, yeah. right? They fled the war. Yes, they they were they're like you run into people that are literally running for their lives. Right, um, I I think that a key part of how we begin to like respect ourselves and respect the dignity of each other is by telling as much stories about ourselves as possible. Um, Do we need a single Nigerian story? I mean, I know Chimamanda talks about the danger of a single story, but there are those who argue that without a Nigerian story, you don't have anything that unites people. Um, as a nation, um, um, I, I was reading an essay some time ago where they said that um, most nations build their nationalism around a glorious past or a foreign past or a foreign enemy. Um, unfortunately, we haven't done. <laughs> <laughs> we have. So I really don't know how how we do it. Um, there are things that people I tell you. You know, are Nigerian, yes. so they talk about resilience. Exactly, that's what they I talk about to say. creativity. That's what I say. They talk about yes. our confidence. Exactly. So there's a whole bunch yes. of actually attributes yes. that people see as Nigerian. And it's interesting. Are enough, in your view? Yes, and it's interesting because you find them ev- everywhere, right? Um, there is n- there is nothing as insulting to the dignity of the average Nigerian as the concept of the lazy Nigerian youth. Is the most insulting thing anyone has ever said about Nigerians. I do not care, like, like because 
Nigerians are not lazy. Uh, of course, like we like, like my bed is a mess, right? <laughs> right. But you find that even though you now have a wife, wife we're coming. <laughs> no, to no, 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 like <laughs> no, like. At, is yeah. it tre- my bed is a, interesting. So my, my bed Aisha is clean this morning. has month. allowed you to actually carry your messy uh, bachelor I'm behavior into her I'm house. I'm trying my best. My bed. So it's interesting. I said my bed is a mess because normally it's a mess, but I'm even surprised because it's actually clean this morning. I'm actually shocked thinking about it. <laughs> but um, I think that more often than not, when people are given opportunity, they don't want to waste it. Mm. One of my one of the easiest. So I I have a I also have a reputation for being too trusted. I can't. I don't live in. Do we? Do we? In many ways, romanticize Nigerians too much because you know, um, we can't run away from the fact that some of the difficulties we're facing today are being perpetuated by fellow Nigerians. Yes. So the the cult crimes, the pastoralist clashes in which people are getting killed, the bandits that are you know storming our schools and taking s- children hostage yeah. that have turned it into a business. The clerics who will keep trying to justify <laughs> what they've done, uh, you know, fundamentally, um, you know, the, the 419 boys they keep arresting in America who are sort of defrauding people, um, we can't run away from the fact that these are Nigerians. And in many ways, if we talk to people here, and it's not a very popular conversation, but there's a perception that our value system has collapsed and that we've become a people for whom money no matter how, is beginning to sort of be our defining feature. We want to make money regardless of how we make it. We celebrate the thieves in our midst, even when we are clear that their source of income is dodgy, or in some cases they've actually been convicted of stealing. All of that says something about us, because outside of these shores, these conversations are taking place yeah. about this shameful thing that keeps going on in this country where we don't seem capable of holding wrongdoers accountable um first of all everything you've you mentioned um again i think that like human beings are opportunistic in nature right why are bandits snatching kids because there are no consequences for their actions that's the only reason like um we saw like all of us saw the biggest most powerful democracy in the world we saw people storm that was literally a coup about to happen right because there were no consequences for the actions we saw that happen right um i think that when it comes to cyber crime we're not the biggest perpetrators of cyber crime north korea is, is where cyber crime is like the most institutionalized right we're not the biggest perpetrators of cyber crime as a country i think that it's also a thing about narratives right um we don't have a lot of ownership about our narratives our own narrative like as a country or as a people why is that do you think because we do have what many will see as media there's naturally i'm inclined to because my kpi involves thinking about money i'm inclined to think about the economic problem of of uh, of that we do not have we do not yet have a market that appreciates um like a lot of diversity in storytelling in media for example and we're not the first people to be there Right, Pulitzer and Hearst built whatever they built today off yellow journalism. Right, they invented yellow journalism. Um, I think that I think that what is happening to Nigeria happens to societies. Um, it sucks that it is people getting affected. It is us getting affected. Right, I I I have people that I care about that have been kidnapped in the past. Right, I have been robbed before on the highway. Um, but I also think a huge part of it is about like this is me referring back to storytelling. There's a lot of impact that just like shaping perceptions can have on all of this, right? So even the few stories that we have, we don't exactly document them. We don't keep them. And I understand that you've now taken the bull by the horn and have started a project which should hopefully, if it works, Hmm. redress a little bit okay. 
um, the problem there. Tell me about that project. Okay, so um, I, I mean, I worked in media, I worked in newsrooms for years, and there was a fundamental problem that every time we wanted to write stories, um, we go to Google, and Google is Google is not a search engine; it's a sorting engine. It brings up the most relevant, most recent stories, right? And what, what that means is that if someone's write about br- my degree today and they search for my degree, it's most likely Boko Haram stories. So their stories will most likely piggyback on Boko Haram. And the summary of that is that we have a serious com- context problem, right? Um, I think that um, knowledge is incremental, right? You build on existing infrastructure and then that's how innovation happens. And to a large extent, even like you, could, you can say that content requires context, right? But we lack context. And the question is, what happens when you suddenly make um, information that was inaccessible to Nigerians available to and accessible to everyone? And we, we um, me and a bunch of people, we thought, you know, a useful place to start with this would be newspapers, for example. You know, the job of a journalist is to show up every day and filing stories, whether they are mundane, whether they are magnificent, every type of story. And it's like, what happens when you take yesterday's news and make it accessible to everyone as tomorrow's history? As today's history rather um and what we want to do is for a start we, we call it like we just call it archiving right for a start the goal is to archive one newspaper a day from january 1st 1960 till december 31st 2010 why 2010 because by 2010 that was when like people finding news on the internet was becoming more mainstream and it's like you take one newspaper a day from this entire time period and you suddenly like f- suddenly like I need I need to know what happened in Nigeria on March 5, 1983. I can find the resources. Um there's this um um what, why does context matter in story Um because I I'll, I'll use one example, right? Um I read um a story on Stairs NG, um interesting publication. And they're talking about the creation of states, states creation, they're talking about um spending the cost of running these states and when i read it i had it i had a kind of frustration my frustration was if, was from the fact that coincidentally the previous weekend i had read some articles from september 1990 right about state creation um babangida had just created new states so there was that was like what everyone was talking about and because i had read just a few articles i was reading that with i had so much context right and i i do not even understand the economics of state creation better than the writer now imagine if that writer with his expertise as an economist had access to those stories and especially given that we're now talking about state creation exactly. as a viable way of um growing the nation yes there's an agitation yes. going on as, yes um, because we are currently have um a constitutional review going on and some people are yeah. saying we want our states yeah so yes yeah. we have states that are not viable exactly right exactly and mm-hmm. it's like and it's like it's like what happens when like um journalists can write those types of stories and start to uh, interrogate like so how um, far along are you with this project? okay that's a good question the single biggest blocker right now is the cac getting registered no. I kid you not. I'll explain. No. <laughs> we want ease of doing business. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what was it? There were, there were, no, no. Like, not that we want, but they were talking about ease of doing business has greatly improved. And that includes <laughs> registering <laughs> new business yes. entities. It's interesting. Um, but what, what we are registering at is limited by guarantee. I did not even know what it meant before we started the process. Uh-huh. And limited by guarantee is kind of like a bit of non-profits, conventional non-profits and for-profits, yeah. right? You can actually do business, but you're not sharing the returns with shareholders. It's going back mm-hmm. into the operation. Mm-hmm. And I, d- I found out why we started that that one requires the consent of the Attorney General. And that has been the place where the most delay has been, right? So the CAC has been quite responsive. I've spoken to even the registrar, like, in this field. These, this these are some of the frustrations that were informing your earlier conversation around how you sort of tighten the funnel yes. and, and do yes. things that would sort of yes. allow Yes, this process started in Q4 last year, in Q4 2020. And you're not able to move on if you want to do things properly, if you die registration. Yes, is not done. because, for example, um, um, Bureau of Archives in Lagos, they showed a lot of enthusiasm, right? 
But like for good reason, they cannot engage until we are a legal entity, so right? They can't can talk to a Fuad. Exactly. They can talk to exactly, me. right? Um, for because like um and like it has come up for like at least two other organizations, mm-hmm. including a one of the big tech, right? It's like oh yes, we cannot engage until you are a legal entity, mm-hmm. right? And that's the single biggest blocker. But here's what needs to happen. What needs to happen is that when we, I'm optimistic that we should have it sorted before the end of July. Um, um, and it's just it's just sad that having it started before the end of July, July means that we had to like go to the office and say what is happening, <laughs> what is happening, who do we need to prostrate for, right? Um, and I, and, I, and I think when you talk about that, that image in my head of who do we need to prostrate yes. for, yes, this notion that we built a country in which you can't just you know, do the right thing and no, things will you can't fall do. into place. You can't. You have to evoke who you know, S- cultural things, there's an int- begging, yes. cajoling, there's abusing, bribing. There's an image I can never get out of my, my head, right? Um, near my house, there's a place that there's always traffic, right? Now, what that traffic does is force some people to take one way, right? And they enter the streets. Now, Guess where police wait? They don't wait at the place solving the traffic problem. They are waiting in the dark for people to take one way. Opportunity. And just like take up advantage of the problem. Instead of trying to solve the problem. Instead of solving the traffic oh. problem. <laughs> it's like, how can I take opportunity? So, so how can you tell me there isn't an issue with sort of our Nigerianism Co- like you did? Earlier? Consequence. Nothing happens to Yes. You? Nothing will happen. Okay. Let's get back to the question of your untidy bed. <laughs> <laughs> I was just joking now, small play. Yes. Um, you left bachelorhood not too long ago. Yeah. And you're really married to someone I think is really awesome. My claim to fame. Yes. <laughs> Aisha Salahuddin, fellow journalist working with CNN. Really, really cool girl, actually. I really like her. Um, what has that been like, transitioning from bachelorhood to to be married. I mean, obviously, you still haven't learned how to clean up after yourself. And I'm surprised she's letting you get away. No, she's not letting me get away with it. That's <laughs> the funny thing. Like, I think the single biggest thing about marriage for me is is accountability. Um, it's like, you know, it's one thing when someone is visiting you occasionally. You're living in and someone is visiting you. But it's like every single day. Like, she walks into a room and I'm like, Checking like, hey, did I drop anything at the wrong place? <laughs> did I drop anything at the wrong place? I I don't know if it's like that for other people, right? But yeah, um, I think the biggest thing for me has been accountability. And whenever people ask me how is marriage going, I say, oh, well, I've not been kicked out. And as long as I've not been kicked out, that's the answer I intend to give for as long as possible. Um, but yeah. But, but look, you're young, you yeah. guys. You're clearly talented. Um, and I know that most gatherings we are gathering together. Yeah where you ask the question, um, who wants to go to Canada? Yeah. And I think only four, <laughs> everybody were like 35. Yeah. Right? And, and literally everybody except sort of like five of us, including yourself, didn't raise their hand. Um, how come a couple like you, who could literally take your pick of where to go? I mean, she already works for an international media company. She works with CNN. So already you know that there would be opportunities if she wanted them. You are highly celebrated in the sort of tech and media circles where you've worked because, you know, the way you've mentored your leadership style, yeah. that sort of thing, and, and the things you've managed to do within a very short period of time. Why are you not tempted to follow a plan B like others? I, I think people that are tempted and are following the plan B, I think that I think that is good. That is them responding to good reason, yes. right? Um, but we're talking about you. Yeah. <laughs> you judgment of other people's decision. I understand that you respect their decision. Yeah. And we all do because everybody ultimately has yeah. to sort of plan for their lives. Well, I'm asking about you. I, 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 your I f- lovely wife, who you, you, you're sort of perfect prime, if you like, candidates for relocation if you chose to relocate. Why has it not been something I, that you guys have? I think for me, um, I, I think for me, it is that um, I don't feel like I have exhausted. I'm I'm not yet in a state of complete helplessness. I don't yet feel help, helpless. Um, 
I've had this interesting phase with my interaction with my environment where as a teenager I was very angry. I used to be really angry all the time. Um, I used to be so angry. And it was mostly because I was like, why, why like, and, and I feel like between the age of 17 and 21, most people's politics are mostly formed. And I, I, I just used to be like, why? Like, it was just a lot of whys for me, right? Then I moved to a place of complete apathy, right? It's like, you know what, as long as my own corner is fine, everybody's fine. Then the place I'm at now is just coming and focusing on what I can control. Um, and it's like, I feel like I have not maxed out on things I can control here. That it has gotten to the point that makes living here completely unbearable for me. Um, I believe that there is an aspirational, in quotes, class of young Nigerians that um, they have access to opportunities outside Nigeria. But they are here, and what tends to happen while they are here is that um, a couple of events happen. The first one that happens is that they try to earn more to secure their bubble right um if nigeria will not work make your house work for you make your community work for you um but not everybody can afford to secure that bubble the people that can't afford to secure that job bubble tend to pick jobs that makes that demands optimism right that is like oh yes oh nigeria i'm, I'm doing my own small work to make nigeria better mm-hmm. or just just this small corner and hopefully if everybody does that maybe it just has some effect all over the place I, I like to think then the third group of course just leave right i like to think i am in a sense a mix of trying to secure my bubble while trying to just do something that you know maybe it has like serious like um, um exponential effects like when i think of this um the the archiving project for example it's like first of all like i just expect that your horizontal impact across different formats of journalism and media it just I just expect that it does explode because suddenly people have access to this information. Um, and when I think of like some other interesting things that some other people might be doing in their small, small pockets, um, I just hope all of it compounds. But yeah, I think the summary is that I'm not yet at a place where I feel completely helpless mm. um, about what I can, about the things I can control. Right. So yeah. Let me try and wrap up yeah. by maybe focusing a little bit on um, the kind of things that the way you sort of think um, of yourself and what you do um, I saw a quote somewhere where you talked about the two things that drive you you talked about curiosity it could Wow, first yeah, I could see me. I, yeah, I know. I saw something where you said, and then you talked about doing, you, you make products that you hope, you know, people like. Yeah. Um, and and I'm, I'm saying this again because, you know, um, within your space, you have a lot of respect. Um, for someone that young, I found it um, extremely, you know, um, illuminating that even, you know, you have so much respect among your peers who sort of see you as, um, as a leader. Um, what do you think has been responsible for that perception of you among your peers, many of whom are also quite accomplished in their own right? So what are the qualities that you think have sort of driven the engagement that you've had across the multiple roles hmm. that you've had within a short period of time that have given you this larger-than-life reputation? <laughs> larger-than-life. <laughs> I think, first of all, is that um, I'm extremely curious. Um, I'm lucky to have had environments that, like, allowed my curiosity to grow. Um, I'm I'm ex I'm extremely curious. That makes me extremely experimental. That means I'm always trying something, um, and I'm always like looking for places to try things. And, and what tends to happen is that people people quiz, I think people like people that can make things. Maybe because we grew up on all the stories of. Well, we invented this, this, we invented that. But people like people that can make things. And what that has done is, which is so weird most of the time, what that has done is that people end up coming to ask me all the time, oh yeah, I want to do this. What do you think I should do? What do you think I should do? What do you think I should do? Then the next part is, I am quite, it's exhausting sometimes, but I'm extremely, I'm quite accessible to a lot of people. Um, so all kinds of people reach out to me for all kinds of things. 
um sometimes it's a little embarrassing because i'm like someone reached out to me and said that i should help with how to like where to find financial aid i'm like <laughs> how did you think i was going to know that he said oh someone just randomly but did, said but did you i did not i, I just i pointed them to someone else that right. because i did not so maybe that was what you were supposed yeah to because do. i was like how is that oh someone said that you know where to apply i'm like uh so do you, do you think people project on you more than you actually yes strongly have in terms of the knowledge and the skill yes base? i believe strongly um i also b- b- i also have but this thing no, you don't resent it do you? N- n- you it it's just maybe? it's just uncomfortable mm-hmm. so another thing again is um people find it very easy to talk to me right. um and <laughs> it's so easy to be a scammer when people find it easy to talk to me because <laughs> you can just talk your way through things and that's why whenever i'm interviewing people like maybe for, for a job and someone just fit i'm like i know this style i know this style that's my style um but yeah i i think that i i've been lucky um, opportunities i've had i've been uh, i've stayed very curious but you, know, you know what people say about luck right that luck is when you know preparation meets opportunities <laughs> ah, <laughs> right? I don't, no comments yeah. i also think i am extremely i have a, a deep discontent with like the current whatever the current state of things are um, i don't do very well with blame so just, just explain that to me you have a deep sense of discontent yeah so if, it doesn't, if, if you're not happy with it your next thing is how to make yeah it better. how to make it better right and and that's why like i'm not even a i'm not much of a hoarder for ideas right if if i have some ideas on how to make it better and i find someone that's willing to run with it i, I just Point. Um so people people always say, Oh, like oh you should sell this idea. But like ideas are like how do they what's that thing they say about ideas? They are easy, right? I'm just invested in those things like coming to life. Like that's that's where I find satisfaction. Like I, I, I contribute I made a small contribution and it, and it worked. I don't even need I don't even need the I don't even need the praise or the attention. My own like a lot of my own personal satisfaction comes from like just seeing things work mm. and now goes back to the imposter syndrome i mentioned earlier something i struggle with at work a lot is that um i i always feel like i'm not good enough right and i, I i'm coming to realize that one of the reasons why i feel, feel i like hope you know it's not that uncommon especially yeah. among high yeah. achievers right yeah uh, oh okay <laughs> <laughs> so i also <laughs> think that a, a key part of why i always feel like that is and i'm never picking my anything in my like weight class right i'm always like trying and and it gets exhausting when you're constantly like trying other things like that so are I, you saying you're tired i i get that i i was in fact for a few weeks up until like like two weeks ago and any time people ask me how are you i just say tired um so i i actually took a two-day break just to take stock um, I also know that I have a tendency to become overwhelmed by all kinds of things. So I, I, I try to create, like, stop gaps. I, I, the analogy I used to describe it is that um, sleepwalkers have this thing where they s- scatter, like, obstacles around the house so that they he hit them and they wake, wake up. up. Or they hit and they wake up. So I try to create those types of things around my life, right, where um, I have, like, a, I keep a daily to-do that I try to be military about. I do a weekly once i leave here i'm going to do my weekly review which is sunday every sunday i kind of try to take stock of the past week i do a monthly reporting system and, 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 and this system that works for you do you think is something that will be useful to young people yeah i yes. I, I think yes i think i am the <laughs> i like to think that i am at the fringes of the absolute worst of many things i feel like um i am most likely to not be accountable so i try to create systems to Hold make me accountable control. right um, if you if you leave me, <laughs> I'm just going to be vibing there, vibes and inshallah, mm-hmm. right? Um, so yeah, I I I think, and I, I I I'm not going to admit that I think I'm extremely critical of myself. And what I try to do to count to solve my imposter syndrome problem is by having data, mm. right? So for example, I worked at what Big Kabao for from 2018 to 2020. We had it was a, I think it was a good run, right? But for the longest time, I, I just did not admit. I kept thinking, oh, did I do enough? Did I do enough? So what I actually now did was now write what I did right, what mm. I did wrong, 
like the things that felt mm. like I got right. And that was when it became a little easier to look like, at your do you understand? time. Then. So I, I used, I tried to track as much as I can about like from my life. That's how. So the data is what helps me to feel better about my imposter syndrome. Mm. I'm going to finish on a conversation on identity. Yeah. Um, not because I kind of like identity politics. In fact, I'm <laughs> an avowed <laughs> critic of it. And I think it's problematic when you meet people and the first thing you think about is where they come from. But the reason I'm bringing it up is because it may well be that the fact that you, your identity keeps getting, uh, people keep getting your identity wrong, whether it is giving you any insight <laughs> into us as a people because I, I'm told people regularly assume you're from the north yeah, because my name and, is and treat Lawa. you <laughs> that way because your name is Fuad Lawa so <laughs> what, what insights have you gleaned from that? Um, again it's a human thing where people just need identifiers to know whether you're with them or you're against them um, I think it's just like fundamental these things I'm saying is one podcast I've been listening to kicking in called Hidden Brain um frankly like my my identity is really just like <laughs> the the identity politics i subscribe to is the one that says that or more just do your own just do your own they go as long as you know make anybody have, as long as you're like you're not screwing anybody else over and you're in your own lane that's where you find me um but i find that across the entire spectrum of a lot of the conversations around identity politics even in nigeria on the internet today i have friends on every I, and i always say that i have relationships I, I used, there's a joke i used to make that there are people on one end of my spectrum that if they meet people on the other end there's going to be violence <laughs> and like it's a fact right because i I have a I have a slight worry about But you don't I mean th that presents a great opportunity to be a bridge builder, right? Yeah, like occasionally you just put in small doses, throw them in the same spaces, right? Um and on one end, for example, I have people who I know people who have never entered public transport ever, right? But like on the other end I have like um like people who run public service like transport like Okada riders on speed dial. And I, I know part of and it's not like I'm just doing it because, oh, yeah, them just say it's from streets. No, no, no. It's because I want to hear gist. I just want to hear, like, oh, how are you? How's your wife in the village? Like, like how is your boy? That kind of stuff. That curiosity yeah. needs to be um, satisfied. Yeah. I'm also, even though I like, I said that, oh, like, there's a certain, to a certain degree, like, I am in a bubble, sort of. I am very, very concerned about staying there. Mm. Right? Because um, I worry about being insulated from, like, the real Nigerian zeitgeist or desired guest in wherever place I am. Um, so there's not a lot of... I don't like any form of extremes. I don't think any is as simple as anything is as simple as extremes. You um, are a Muslim? Yeah. And in the last decade or so, Islam <laughs> has become, it's whether so we like it or not, so wild. Like a byword for... Terrorism, so unfairly, wild. some I people would argue, but like, nonetheless, is there? Yeah. So, how like, does so that make yeah. you feel as a young Muslim man <laughs> in the south? And when I say the south, I don't mean the south of Nigeria. I mean the south of the world. Yeah. You um, know. I, I think first of all, the first thing I always tell people is that it is intellectually dishonest when Muslims say um, Boko Haram they are not true Muslims. So how does that even mean? Like, their politics is driven by like. Um, belief like their belief systems right and what you need to do is now try to figure like if you're in denial of that part I do not like when people disrespect or gaslight their enemies in a sense because what you're doing is undermining them and that's how they defeat that's how they win right but when you understand those problems very deeply um, I, 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 th I think that how, how do Muslims accepting that Boko Haram are Muslims help to defeat them by defeating the systems that created Boko Haram, right? The scholars that are, like those scholars in the north that are teaching now, for example, making sure that they never have a voice. That's how. That's that how are teaching extremist ideologies, exactly. right? Like that's how you. That's how you beat it. Um, um, like I know someone that grew up in Joss, and s they just randomly listen to a tape. Some guys, and there was a there was a, there was a riot in Joss. I was about to say normal riot. 
so sad. Mm. There was a riot in Joss, and they just took advantage of the chaos, and they just went to a school and like butchered kids, like because of a tape they listened to. Do you understand? Um, so radicalization essentially. Yes. Um, I I think that I think that there was a period where I used to be so bothered. Like because people are all, or I, I I lived in the south south southeast for a few years in the early part of the 2010s, and there was a lot of people asking like people would ask me like oh why why are you killing my brothers why are your brothers killing me? and I'm like I remember one day I was in my room uh, there are six people in my room and I was so angry that day and one of them said why but why be say they always like now they always keep people I said who who which person food not chop pass for this room. And I, yeah, because I was wondering, I used to cook for the room, right? And I was like, you, I'm the last to sleep. You will eat my food all the time. I, if if everyone was that easy, I will kill all of you. And um, and yet, gone. when they look at you because of what's going on, yes. they see the brother of a killer. Yes. I mean, yes. that that for me is... It's, it got so bad that we um It got so bad that I, s- I used to, like, get random, s- like, stop and search. There was a period when Shaka was... As Shaka was doing Sunday to Sunday, Right? I was getting randoms like stop and search. Like it was a thing that was happening. Um yeah, but like those people say people say it's a it's a trauma response. That's what people say everywhere. At least what in these days that's trauma response. But like those things don't get to me again. Like mm. is, is there, there's a real real problem yeah. with profiling isn't yeah, there yeah. and and i i what i find really strange when i talk to um nigerians my fellow nigerians about profiling is that when it's done in south africa leading to xenophobic attacks say against nigerians yeah. or when you're fighting against um white supremacy yeah. um against you know black people being profiled almost instantly we get it but when we bring it home and we talk about profiling each other, um, you know, and we do it to a certain degree across yep. the country. Um, we think about a certain group as being responsible for the drugs yeah. and for the 419s and all of that. We think of a certain group as being cultists. We think of a certain group as being the kidnappers and yeah. the ba- you know that sort of thing. So we, was, but why is it so easy for us when it is outside, in your view, to see it and understand its problems but when it comes to us we don't have that sort of ability to to to, to think that way yeah i mean i i guess again it still comes down to like very very fundamental like um like human behavior we think the best of ourselves we're inclined to think the best of ourselves so we don't think we're as horrible as the people that we are scrutinizing um so i i really think it's a human problem because like even white people don't always see their racism right mm. um um south africans will justify their xenophobia right um nigerians will like th- I, I think the very very funny one is there's this whole i so I, as as a as when i was much younger i used to see it only in foreign media like the north versus the south it didn't really translate in how we interacted mm. right but like now actually like i see it a lot where people are like oh yeah yeah and it's so it's so fascinating when um like people from the south are being like um are saying things about the north and they just like use their big english right to like wax their bigotry mm. and it's always so fascinating to watch right that oh okay so you think you, you think, think because you've like, hidden it in yeah, big, exactly, words, you have big words right mm. I, I think it's just uh, I but think it's not a one-way street because yeah, as someone who sort of listens to um house tapes and yeah, you know that of course, kind of thing you of kind course, of know that it's a, although it may seem that way maybe because of the dominance of the media and yeah. all of so, that so like i mean i'm like i'm what i'm yoba and i'm muslim and like islam has been in yoba land for over 100 years but somehow like there are <laughs> there are people who there are people in the north who might think that oh you're not a muslim. proper muslim yeah, 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 like, yeah. Uh, we are in the east, and people think that oh, because you're a Muslim, oh, definitely you yeah, are house hard. and it's, it's the most ridiculous thing. Mm. But like to be honest, I do not lose any sleep over these things. Okay, yeah, let, let's end up with a, a conversation that I think is practical around lifelines and Lagos living for <laughs> young people. <laughs> How does one create lifelines? How does one navigate life in Lagos? Because it is tough. Lagos is tough. Um, there's rice at home. Very important <laughs> to know that. Um, 
um, as much as you can. If you can outsource, outsource it. Um, when, when living in Lagos, we are constantly racing against time. I think that fundamentally that's what we are doing in Lagos. Because and of traffic. Traffic. Um, yes, traffic fundamentally, right? Um, we lose too many hours in traffic every week. And if you're going to figure out how to gain back that time, figure it out. Um, I think we should stay at home too, as much as they can. It's not realistic for everybody. Um, I think we should find their tribe. Um, something that I know makes Nigeria bearable for a lot of people is knowing that they're not alone. Mm in how they think, how they see the world, what their expectations are. And if you find And the troubles they're going yes, through. Exactly, the troubles they're going through. So find your tribe, you know, um, outsource, and remember that there's rice at home. Remember that there's rice at home. What if there's no rice at home for it? Ah, there's eh? no rice at home. And there's no rice at home for a lot of people. Yes. There's no rice at home for a lot of people. We need to figure out how to get rice to those people. And that is actually quite profound, especially because we're staring at food shortages. Yeah, it's interesting because this is what happened during the Spanish flu. Um, um, the pandemic triggered some things that led to reducing productivity. And by 2021, 22, food riots broke out in Sierra Leone. Right. Um, 2020, sorry. Um, 1920. 1920. <laughs> okay. 1922, sorry. Food riots broke out in Sierra Leone. Um, and they've been predicted as well yes. for, for this pandemic. Yes. Um, that would be really bad if that yeah. happens. Um, as much as I can, like, um, again, like I said, it's very easy to feel helpless. I'm very invested in, like, the people in my proximity. Like, I'm making sure that... Um, like they can get better anybody i interact with for example i go to the market right when i used to go to the market every time and someone wants to buy tomato i want to buy tomato and the person says one thousand i'm never going to say ask for 950 never five the 15 i'll not make a difference in my life but it might do this yes it will okay. and like like on, there was a day i was too embarrassed i was so embarrassed that day she, i was the last person that showed up she was parking and she, I just, she, I just wanted to buy a tomato, and she, she was, she was even shy to tell me the price, maybe because the price has been sending people away. I went to tell me the price, and I bought three. And this one like almost like burst into tears. I was too embarrassed. I was like, "Hey God, it's just tomato I'm buying." Do you understand? And, so and there are a lot of people like that. Do a little bit of what we can, each and yeah. every one of yes. us. Um, yeah, are I you just, crying for? Nah, it's time? just I, nah, I'm not crying yet. I'm <laughs> a, I'm a, but yeah, it's just really hectic um, because there's only so much. I mean, when you think about it in the context of jurisdictions, right? My jurisdiction is my family, my neighborhood, right? If I'm being, if I'm overreaching, the jurisdiction of a local government chairman is his local government or a local government. The jurisdiction of a state governor is his state. Jurisdiction of a, of, a, of a president is this country, right? I feel responsible for my jurisdiction, right? In a sense, that's why, for example, I'll go back to the th uh, thoughtful leadership and sense of ownership. Like, do you have a deep sense of ownership? And, of and, 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 and the, the general sense we have now of the leadership we have is that they're not taking ownership. I, I do and not they're think not that Buhari has, has a bone in his body. That has a sense of ownership. Maybe he did in the past. I've never, you know, I've, ne I've never seen him actually. Take and the truth is, even if he did, the fact that he's perceived as not to have is a problem. Yes, because people, people like because that matters yes, as much as the reality. Is extremely reality. important. Is and like, it can I be everything it, in exactly. many cases. And, and I and I feel like one of the examples of when people try to undermine the value of media and how to use media. You look at the governor of um, or your states, mm. right? He's just been a regular governor, as far as I'm concerned. Right, but he's also investing in perception. Yeah. Okay, so there's a camera over there. Yeah. Tell President Buhari the direct message that you have for him. Just have a sense of ownership, right? If a thing is going wrong, it is not the fault, and you are responsible for that thing. It's not the fault of your neighbor. It's not the fault of the past owner. It's not the fault of... It is, like, as long as you are responsible for that thing, right... 
that sense of ownership has to come from you. I've never seen Buhari take responsibility for anything. I've seen him only he has blamed the past president, blamed lazy Nigerian youth, blamed people trying to that he said to were trying to kick him out of office, blamed people. Buhari has never said, ah, this one is my fault. I've never heard it before. If you find, if there's any place where you've, you've seen Buhari actually take ownership of anything, I'd like to see it. I've never seen it. I I I I I, ha- I can't respect a like a person who can't take ownership of anything. I I can't stand blamers. It just drives me nuts because blamers are the same people as I told you so people, and they are the two worst types of people to have when things are going south. <laughs> Talking about Barry always stresses me. Like he doesn't inspire anything. Like. That is that is a damning verdict. Let me say this: is a damning verdict for a president, from essentially someone who represents the largest demography in the country. Yes. Yes. So, like, it doesn't inspire any hope. It doesn't inspire any confidence. You know how when you're going out with like your friend, right, and like. Just hanging around this friend. I, th- I feel like we've all had that moment where we were with someone we were embarrassed to be with for some reason. Maybe because they did something in the past or anything. But like, like imagine there was a party, right? There was just a party in the world. And like your plus one was Bari. Well, everybody's asked to come with their president. Yeah, was like, come with your plus one and your plus one is Bari. <laughs> You're not going to be like, yeah, like my ancestors are from Benin Republic. <laughs> He doesn't inspire anything. Fuck. Happy to quite disown him is what you're telling me. He, because he doesn't inspire anything for me. Like, I won't lose any sleep. Fuad Lawal, thank you so much for joining us on quarter to twelve. Yeah, thank you for having me. I hope I did not bore you. I hope I did not bore you. I hope I did not bore you. I'm sure nobody's going to be bored listening to this. Yeah. Thank you again. And uh, this is the July edition of quarter to twelve. And uh, we'll be back with a brand new edition in August. Keep listening and keep watching. And this is, of course, a product for Radio Now. I am Kadria Ahmed. I am Fuad Lawal. <laughs>